Do you wish you could fling your friend across space and time on solar panels? Are you on PlayStation, but your weird friend that blows everything up is on Xbox? Well, think no more, because the Ronin Empire has set up a cross-platform server for all kinds of players to enjoy. All you have to do is join the Discord, agree to our community rules, and you can join a public crossplay server just by entering a password. Honestly, we would love to have you. Love to see the clang that gets involved, and would l absolutely love to see your guys' creations that you're able to build on whatever system you are on. So go ahead, join the Discord, and we'll see you in the server. Howdy everybody, welcome back to the channel. We're going to do a little bit of a continuation of our Automation 101 mini-series within a series. Uh, just to get you guys a little bit more familiar with the blocks we're going to be using on our little Mars exploit that we're doing currently in the series. We already went over the power blocks, and I went over those because on Mars, power generation is going to be a little bit different. On Mars, we're going to be using hydrogen engines, reactors, solar, and wind in a combination to kind of make it efficient and aesthetic purposes mainly. But along with that, we're going to be doing a little more combat stuff. And I know we've been using a lot of the event controllers and timer blocks, and I did the Automation 101 video to kind of introduce you to those timer blocks and event controllers and all of the flight stuff but i want to get a little more in depth with the program side of space engineers where minus the programmable blocks that you actually have to write scripts or get scripts from the workshop with i want to go in depth with the event controllers and the other blocks you see behind me including sensors oddly enough to kind of get a little basic knowledge of programming without having to write code so to get you into the thought process of it basically once you get into the basics of it once you see these things in action like we have been doing yes you can copy what other people have done watch their tutorial videos but this i hope will give you a sense of how they are used in a more dynamic situation or just basic messing around and be able to use that knowledge to make your own creations and hopefully get you a little more into the programming side. So grab your crayons, your aluminum foil hats, and make sure your brain cells are in order. Let's get class started. So to start the class off easy, we're going to be going off something very simple, and that is the sensor. Now, the sensor here is the automation sensor, and it's very simple in how it works. When it detects an entity, whether it's a grid, a character, whatever, it triggers an action. We could set that action in its control panel. We can also set the extent of its limits. Now to be able to see those limits, we are going to need to see show on HUD. We need to go into our info tab and put on show sensors field of range. Now we can see the range of our sensor. What do you need, right? You can adjust it as you need to in the control panel with the sliders that it provides. You can do left, right, bottom, top, back, and front. So all six sides. And it just builds off of that cube. You can make them bigger, smaller, whatever you need to do to be able to do the action that you want. Now the action we're going to have our sensor do is just turning on and off a light. As long as you can make it turn on and off a light, you can make it do anything. The other reason we're just doing a light is because if we go into setup actions we see we only have two slots these are not going to both trigger at the same time if we look over here slot one is on first detection so once something crosses into that field of range 
slot 2 is when it no longer detects anything in that range. Makes sense, right? So, if it detects me inside of its range, it turns the light on. If it detects me outside of its range, it turns it off. Very, very simple. And all we have to do is, if I remove these, go to our inset light and just toggle block on. And then, if it doesn't detect anything, we're going to make it turn that light off. Very, very simple. Just if this, then that. Or else do this. That is all it is doing. Think of everything we're going to be doing today as if this, then that statement. That is basically everything we're going to be working on. And this is the basics of that. It shows it at the simplest level. And if you can get this part down, then the rest of it will come pretty easily. If not, don't worry. I will help you through it. Our next block, up until the automatons update, was the biggest block for programming minus the actual programmable block in Space Engineers. Especially on consoles, the timer block is essential for doing multifunction tasks in one push of a button. What the timer block does, if we go into it, is it has the option to use a delay function, which when you push a button, if we do start, it will actually count down and it has an audible tick and it has a flashing light for that full 10 seconds. And then once the 10 seconds hit zero, it will do its actions. Now, it will do all of these actions at the same time. So we can actually have it do multiple things, and that's what we're gonna do. Now, in this setup, the basic use for a timer block is an airlock. Very simple, easy to do, and not hard to set up at all. The only thing you'll need is two doors, obviously, because an airlock needs two doors. An air vent, which preferably would be hooked to a tank, but for our example, I do not have that. And then a button. And then hopefully your area is sealed. That way you don't lose any of that precious O2 and don't suffocate, which is always a good thing. In our timer block, we are going to set the delay I normally do about one to two seconds for an airlock. Doesn't have to be, you can put it all the way down to do it instantly. That one to two second marks, the two second mark especially, gives time for you to actually get through the door in case your button is outside the doors. Sometimes on a smaller ship, it that's just where you can put your button because your doors are back to back. Um, or even on some bases, you'll be able to actually put the button on the outside, press the button, go into the airlock, have it close, and that way you cannot cancel that uh, airlock system until it's fully done. Go on the outside of the airlock from the other side, say you're in space, and push the button on that side to come in. It's kind of, I say a safety net if you will. But what we're going to do is we're going to put the delay down to zero, go to our actions, and we're just going to have it open and close each door. All I have it set to is uh, open and closed. That's it. And then we do that for both doors. The other thing we're going to do is to depressure depressurize on and off. That way it just toggles between them. And then we go to our button and we say set up the button. Now this this particular button uses three different buttons on it that you can press. 
we're only going to be using the big red button. And all we have to do is go to timer. And we're going to choose timer block 2 in this case for the example. And we're just going to hit start. That starts the countdown. So whether you have it at 10 seconds, 1 second, doesn't matter. It starts that countdown. And then you will want one door closed, one door open, and preferably the one that's open is going to be inside the ship, inside the base, the pressurized zone. And then your air vent also pressurized. Then all we have to do is hit our button. So that door closes, the vent goes to depressurize, and that door opens. Pretty nice come back in you hit the button this will normally be pressurizing the room i don't have a tank on it so it's not doing that pretty simple right well, now what we can do is add a second timer block to actually lock and unlock the doors thing is you will need a second set of timers to actually pull that off. So if we just add two more timer blocks. So we're gonna change our actions a little bit to compensate and make those doors lock behind and after we use the airlock. So our first timer block, we gotta think about the steps we wanna go through. First, we want the inside door to close. Then we want the air vent to depressurize. And then we want the outside door to turn its power on. Once we have those set up, we can go into the next timer block, set its delay to pretty low. It doesn't have to be as low as it can go, but wherever you feel comfortable. With this one, we're going to take our outside door and we are going to open it. And then we are going to turn off the inside door. This way, when we hit our button, it will open the back door to the outside and it will lock this one. But now that we have two timer blocks, we need to go back to our first one, set up actions, and add that next timer block into its secret sequence. And we just do that by selecting start. So now I have this door turned off, which would be the outside door, and it is closed. Our air vent is trying to pressurize, and the inside door is open and turned on. So if I hit our button, this door closes, that turns to pressurize, that turns on and opens, and now this door is off and closed. Sounds good, right? Now, we need to set up the action in reverse, because as of right now, I can't go back in the ship. <laughs> so, let's go ahead and toggle that part. We're going to go into our third timer block to start this sequence, and it is going to be just the opposite of our first timer block. So if we go into setup actions, we have our first door. Our inside door is going to turn on. Our outside door is going to close. And our air vent is going to depressurize off. And then we are going to preemptively add our last timer block as well. And we just hit the start button. 
Now in our last timer block, we can set the delay down, go to setup actions, and we can do the inside door is going to open. The outside door is going to turn off and that's it. That should be our full sequence. Now the last thing we have to do, oh God, is go into our airlock again, go to our second button and add that third timer block. It says number four for me because I have the uh, show one and we are going to start it. So now if I hit this button, it should close this door, turn it off, turn depressurize off on the vent so it's trying to pressurize the area and turn on and open our inside door. Let's see if we got everything right. Closed, turned off, our vent's trying to pressurize, and then on and open. I like it. So that is your basic airlock system with basic timer blocks. Pretty neat, huh? I like it. And that's basically how you use the timer. It is a block used in sequence with others to do multiple steps at once and to trigger other steps to happen. It needs other blocks to trigger it, but it can also trigger itself, turn itself on, stop, start other timer blocks and other basically usable blocks. Pretty simple. If you can make this simple airlock, you'll be able to do a lot more with these. The next block we're going to be looking at is the custom turret controller. Now the custom turret controller has a couple different functions. It's a little more limited on what it can do because it needs certain blocks to function and those blocks have limitations. So this block as far as usefulness is really only useful for actual turrets you can use it to um, control different objects such as the automatic mining drill that we created in a previous episode where all we needed to do was uh, remote access into the custom turret controller and move our drill around and we could tell it to keep drilling now it also is used for solar towers as well since the automatons update allows the camera to target the sun which is very very nice the biggest use of the turret controller though is what we are going to be looking at which is obviously turrets now when it comes to a turret controller and making turrets solar towers whatever it happens to be they're actually very simple you only need three different things so the turret controller can work with like a fully functional ai gun turret or a solar tower or even a mining drill you need preferably an advanced rotor I have a regular one just for display and showing purposes. A hinge. If you are making a turret like this one, it uses a hinge with a small head on it. A, a cargo converter, a conveyor converter. And then your guns and a camera. The camera is the important part on top. That is what actually allows the AI to lock on to different things, whether it be the sun or an enemy ship. Now, if we go into our turret controller, we can see in its options, numerous different things, right? So we'll start from the beginning. You can choose what shows up on the screen like everything else. It's actions, which we will get into here in a moment. The azimuth rotor. Azimuth 
is going to be left and right. We will just do rotor two in this case. Azimuth elevation rotor is going to be your hinge. Elevation is always up and down. Assigned camera. We're going to do camera two. And then you can change your velocity multipliers. Now, this is the maximum velocity that the rotor can actually move. So how fast does it rotate? How fast does it go up and down on the hinge? That's basically what it's telling you. I like to just leave these at default because it's not terrible. The angle deviation. Angle deviation refers to mainly turrets where it will only shoot at a target if it is within that deviation range. So if it is within five degrees of being locked onto a target, it will shoot. If you put this down to 0 0.05, it will almost never shoot if the target is moving. Now, there are times where the target is moving closer to your turret at a straight line and you have your turret set up where its multipliers are really nice and smooth and it can follow that drone pretty easily and stay on target. It's very difficult though to keep that exact angle. So we normally just leave it at default. Five degrees is not very much. It's not too far off. At max, I would bring it down to maybe three. And that's only because that little bit of accuracy is nice for saving ammunition if you are limited on magnesium. Um, but that'd be about the only upside to it. Always aim at sun is where we make solar towers out of it. You can choose the available tools and weapons for our turret. The next part is the biggest part. Enable AI on or off. This actually allows the turret to target enemies and shoot at them. If you turn it off, the turret's just going to sit there. Aiming radius. How far do you want that turret to start locking on to enemies? And then you have your targeting options. Targeting options basically are what the turret's going to target. You target neutrals. We normally keep this off just because if a trading ship is flying by or if you have a turret on your rover or a miner or a flying ship then it's going to target any neutrals which isn't always a good thing because well let's be honest being a pirate to everything is actually pretty fun but sometimes being able to trade for certain materials is also nice too target unowned you can turn this on off it really doesn't matter the biggest reason i leave this off is because when a block is unowned it's normally because it fell off of a ship that just got destroyed so maybe you want to grind that part down maybe you want to get the parts off of that or you want to take that part and put it on your current ship or base and you want to use it it also is nice to turn it off because if pieces fall off of enemy ships while you're flying and that small piece is now closer than that um, enemy ship that you're shooting, it will sometimes switch to that piece and start trying to shoot at that falling piece instead of the ship that's still flying around. Biologicals. Now this is considered characters and NPCs. So NPC characters, wolves, spiders, that's what that's talking about. Projectiles, so missiles basically is what it's talking about. Meteors is next. I mean, you can target meteors. A lot of people play with meteors off, so that one usually just gets turned off for me. Target grids. Now this is basically uh basically what it says grids as in like ships bases planes rovers 
anything with blocks. Subsystems. So if you turn subsystems on, it is going to target specific subsystems on the ship. So if you do the subsystem as weapons, thrusters, power generation, it's going to target those over anything else over the ship. And then you have large and small grid. So basically your large ships and bases, and then rovers, small flyers, drones, or small grid. Subsystems. This is those subsystems that you're able to target up top. Offense, utility, power, production, thrust, jumping, steering. Jumping means jump drives. So any ship with a jump drive, it's going to target that jump drive first. Offense. If it has guns, it's going to aim for the guns on the ship. Utility is usually drills, um, grinders, welders, those three. Power is, of course, like hydrogen engines, batteries, reactors, etc. Production is your refineries, assemblers, O2 generation, and then thrust is pretty self-explanatory. And then steering is cockpits, gyros, that kind of thing. And that's pretty much it. When it comes to custom turret controllers, they're very simple, very, I, I don't want to say single-minded because they are used for solar towers as well, but they are mainly used for solar towers and just these turrets. If you need help setting one of these up, it's pretty self-explanatory and shouldn't be too difficult. I think the biggest, hardest part for setting up a custom turret controller is going to be designing the turret itself. Because as you can see, mine looks like a little kid with a bowl haircut. Doesn't look pretty, but still useful. And our last and final block that we're going to go over today, because we went pretty in-depth with the AI control with the flight in the last one, this one, I want to go over the event controller in a little more detail because this is the block that's pretty much changing the game when it comes to programming without the use of a programmable block, as well as extending what programmable blocks can actually do in junction with event controllers. And to help explain event controllers, we are just going to wave hi. You know, when they teach you coding and programming, they have you do say hello function. This is going to be very similar. So let's look at our event controller. The event controller basically takes a statement and figures out if that statement is true or false. What I mean by statement is if a certain block has a certain parameter, then I'm going to do this. If it is not that certain parameter, I will do this instead. So it actually has that statement pretty much able to be filled out for you. If the cargo in this case is greater than or equal to, so that's our parameter or the condition, and then it gives you the threshold or the percentage that it has to be filled. Then it's going to do the first action. If the cargo is not filled to greater than or equal to its threshold, it will do the second option. Keep that in mind. The first one is if the threshold is met. The second one is if it is not. We are not always going to use the second uh, slot in the toolbars. So let's go ahead and show you what I mean. So let's change cargo filled 
to angle changed. If that is equal to or greater than, let's say 45. And we are going to make sure we have the correct name. Let's just call it hinge hand. Now we can see which one it is. We will add that one. And we're going to select actions and we are going to take our hinge hand and just reverse. Pretty simple. We're not going to use that second slot because we don't need it. If the hinge hasn't met that 45 degree threshold, we're just going to let it keep going. So it just stays what it is. Now, all we have to do is make sure our velocity on the hinge goes up. And we'll go to 1. And once it hits 45, we see our event controller tick. And it now goes back the other way. Now let's go ahead and turn our hinge off. Oops. Eh, we'll fix it. And we're going to add a second event controller. Now in this event controller, we're going to do the same thing. Angle changed. Except we're going to change it to equal to or less than. And then our threshold is going to be negative 45. We're going to choose our hinge hand again and the same thing we're going to take our hinge hand and just reverse simple easy to remember now if we turn our hinge hand back on set our velocity back up to let's make it two now we should be able to see this event controller tick and move it back and then once it gets to negative 45 we will see this event controller tick and we've now waved high so now we have our waving hand pretty simple right the only thing you have to be careful with is with event controllers the speed of the object whether it be filling up or rotating does matter because if i change 2 rpm to 5 rpm we can see that it works pretty well if we change that 5 rpm to 10 still works the only thing you're gonna see is sometimes the event controller gets a little buggy especially when first setting them up that if it exceeds that limit it's not going to see that limit all the time so what normally happens is you'll have to set up your event controllers you'll see that the hand triggers once or twice going in both directions or both event controllers actually trigger but only once so it'll trigger in the positive for this one send it back this way trigger for this one send it back towards the positive but then just keep going easiest way to do or get rid of that is just to when it happens reset your event controllers reset the uh, hinge or rotor whatever it happens to be and get on your way it normally will fix it sometimes you have to actually set the hinge vertical like in the middle and then make sure your event controllers are set properly and then turn the hinge on that's the easiest way to do it without any issues but that's the basics of event controllers they can get very complicated very fast, 
if you want to put these in junction with our timer blocks that is the most common use of them so an event controller when this hand reaches 45 degrees it will trigger a timer block and I can actually show you that. So what we will do is keep our hand in the middle where it's not trying to trigger either event controller. Reset both event controllers so they're green ready to go. And normally you just do that by turning them off and back on again. And in the actions, instead of reversing our hand only, we're gonna go to toolbar number two, grab our timer block for our inside door. Remember the big red button we were pressing? And we're just going to start that. Simple, easy to remember. Now let's go to our second event controller, select actions, toolbar two, and go to our closed door sequence and press start there. Simple, right? Now, to make it look somewhat decent, let's only do the velocity on this to about two. That way we have time to make sure our event controller works without having to sit here and watch paint dry. It has triggered both of them. We will watch it go back one more time. And it did. Now, if we come over to our door and we keep an eye on our event controllers. And there we go. Our door is opening and doors are closing. And you can see how you can use event controllers with timer blocks and be able to make creations and be able to use them together to make basic programs that you don't have to write 30 40 lines of code just for one section where these blocks already have it in them and with that i hope this helps you guys understand how event controllers timer blocks custom turret controllers, and even sensors can be used to automate processes and make wonderful creations and ingenious ideas come to life without having to write really a single line of code, just thinking in a code writer's mindset. And it should help you guys understand, but if it does not, we are always in the Discord ready to help, willing to help, and someone is usually either playing or able to answer but other than that hope you guys enjoyed the video like subscribe do whatever you want to do join the discord and join our public crossplay server whether you're on playstation xbox or pc we have a bunch of people already that having fun having a blast a lot of clang involved already and we'll see you guys in the next episode have a good night, everybody.